Let's practice some epoxide ring opening reactions. Epoxide ring opening can take place under either acidic or basic conditions. The first reaction that we're looking at is taking place under basic conditions. And we know that because the reagent that we're using in step one has a negative formal charge on it. That's always gonna be the case for our basic reagents. They are going to have negative formal charges. This is like an SN2 reaction. So the nucleophile is going to be attacking the carbon that has the least steric hindrance. Now, when I say it's attacking the carbon with the least steric hindrance, it's just referring to the two carbons of the epoxide. Those are the only two carbons that are available for attack. It's not gonna be attacking something like out here. So looking at the two carbons of the epoxide, the one with the least steric hindrance is the carbon that's on the right-hand side. So our nucleophile is gonna attack that carbon and kick off the leaving group, if you wanna think about it like that, break the carbon-oxygen bond. We haven't done anything to the other carbon in the epoxide, so the stereochemistry of that methyl group doesn't change. The oxygen has a formal negative charge on it because it has picked up the electrons from this bond. And we've added this OME nucleophile. In the second step of the reaction, we use water just simply to protonate the O- of the oxygen that used to be part of the epoxide. And so this gives us an alcohol. Here is uh, another um, basic condition, ring opening reaction. This might look at first like, hey, there's no negative formal charge, but re remember with a Grignard reagent, we want to treat them like they are an R minus reagent. So our actual reagent here does have a negative formal charge on it. Because this is an SN2 reaction, we are going to have inversion of stereochemistry, and this is something that we're um, practicing in this problem right here. We're going to use our R-, minus, and we're going to attack the carbon of the epoxide, so either one of these two carbons, that has the least steric hindrance. That's going to be the carbon down here on the bottom and open up that carbon-oxygen bond. So drawing the stereochemistry correctly for this might be a little bit tricky. First thing I'm going to do is just draw the stereochemistry on the carbon that we did not um, mess with because that guy's stereochemistry has absolutely not changed. So over here on this carbon, we do need to show that there is inversion of stereochemistry here. And it's kind of a little bit tricky to see how we're going to show that. Um, for me, it's helpful to keep in mind that there is a hydrogen on this carbon atom and that hydrogen is on a wedge. And so what I'm going to do over here is draw that hydrogen on a dash, which helps me realize that the other available bond for the Grignard reagent that we're using here is going to be on a wedge. And then step two, we're bringing in our water molecule to protonate and finish the reaction. And so again, the trick that I'm using there is just filling in this hydrogen with whatever bond it, um, whatever bond it's supposed to have, wedge or a dash, and then inverting that hydrogen, which gives me an opportunity to determine the correct stereochemistry of the nucleophile that's being brought in. So now we're going to look at some epoxide ring opening reactions under acidic conditions. How are you going to recognize when you're dealing with an acidic reagent? Acidic reagents are either going to be positively formal charge um, or they are going to just be the acids that you're accustomed to dealing with, like HCl, HBr, HI, H2SO4, or maybe you'll just see H+, something along those lines. For the acidic condition reactions, first of all, you have an oxygen in the presence of an acid. So the very first thing that you should always do here is protonate the oxygen. We're not even going to read anything else until we get this step done. Always oxygen gets protonated by the acid. So once that's done, the nucleophile is going to attack one of the carbon atoms of the epoxide. In this problem, the nucleophile is the oxygen of the CH3OH, the methanol. Where the nucleophile attacks is a little bit weird for the acidic condition reaction. 
Um, the nucleophile has preference for attacking a tertiary carbon. That's its first choice. So this isn't really SN2-ish. It's more like an SN1 reaction um, where we assume that the carbon oxygen bond is breaking slightly prior to the actual attack of the nucleophile. So it's going to break at a tertiary carbon. In this particular epoxide over here, we have a carbon atom that's bonded to two others, so that's a secondary, and then we have a carbon atom that's bonded to three others, so it's a tertiary. So this nucleophile is going to attack this carbon atom and open up this carbon-oxygen bond. Because we didn't do anything to the epoxide carbon on the left, we don't want to do anything to its stereochemistry, so we'll leave that guy's stereochemistry alone. And um, the stereochemistry, let's see, we've got this on here, the stereochemistry of the carbon that's being attacked is always going to be inverting. So one of the ways that we can represent that is by leaving everything on the wedge and the dash like it is but draw this new nucleophile down on the bottom instead of up on top. So that's going to work to invert the stereochemistry. Um, this, is, this is going to be a protonated intermediate. We're just going to need to use something like use another CH3OH molecule to deprotonate. This is pretty similar to techniques um, or strategies that we used when we were learning SN1 and SN2. If we are attacking with a neutral nucleophile, it is going to have a positive formal charge on it, and we're going to need to deprotonate it in the last step. Okay, so let's take a look at our next example. First thing that we're always gonna do, because we have an oxygen in the presence of an acid, we're gonna protonate our oxygen. That's always going to be step one. And there is our um, there is our intermediate ready to go. Remember the nucleophile, so in this case the nucleophile is going to be the chloride ion that comes off of the HCl. The nucleophile attacks a tertiary carbon. Here we have a carbon that's bonded to two, so that's secondary, and a carbon that's bonded to one, so that guy's primary. So we don't have any tertiary carbons. What do we do? If there are no tertiary carbons, then it's going to attack a primary carbon. So this is a little bit weird. Its preference is for tertiary, Next preference is for primary, so it's not going in order tertiary to secondary to primary, which would be really nice if it did. It goes from tertiary to primary. So our chloride is going to attack our primary carbon, and we get this molecule right here. Because our nucleophile was not neutral, our product doesn't need to be deprotonated. Here we have one final example. First thing that we're going to do is protonate our oxygen with this H2SO4 molecule. And it's gonna give us this intermediate right here. Our nucleophile in this reaction is the lone pair of electrons on the oxygen of the water. Preference is for a tertiary carbon. This is the carbon that's bonded to three. So this is a tertiary carbon right here. So that's where we're going to get the attack and open up this carbon oxygen bond. Remember that we need to invert that stereochemistry. So the methyl group that is on a wedge is now going to be on a dash. And that means the water molecule that we've added is going to be on the wedge. I'm gonna move this a little bit. The positive formal charge on the oxygen um, and then let's also not forget about this half of the molecule over here. Nothing happened to that carbon, so nothing happens to its stereochemistry. We have a positively charged intermediate. We just need to deprotonate it. We could use another water molecule for the deprotonation, just like that. And our product looks like this.